Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Peter Pham was born in Vietnam and is a globally recognised theologian. He is general editor of Theology and Global Perspective and Ethnic American Pastoral Spirituality. His writings have received wide acclaim and been translated into many languages. Peter Pham was the first non-Anglo to be elected president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. His writings address a variety of topics, including Asian missions and theology. Recently, his work has traced the development and features and implications of the shift of Christianity from Europe and North America to Africa, Asia and Latin America. Peter Pham, welcome to the Global Church Project. Thank you so much, Graham. In your book, In Our Own Tongues, you talk about enculturation and how enculturation affects mm -hmm. the relationship between gospel and culture. Right. What is enculturation and yes. how does it work? Well, enculturation is the term preferred by the Roman Catholic Church. It mm -hmm. was, um, in the Protestant circles, they use the term contextualization. Mm -hmm. And basically it means that the, in the encounter between the gospel and a particular culture, let's say the mm. Vietnamese culture. Mm. Uh, when the first Christians arrive in Vietnam, the first thing they encounter is of course people. Mm. But people have certain ways of talking, mm. speaking. And so how does the gospel encounter mm. all the people who present the gospel to the Vietnamese for instance? Mm. How can they talk to them in a way that the Vietnamese people understand could understand them. And so this dynamics between the encounter, mm. the gospel with its Greek, Hebrew, Greek cultures, mm. and the Vietnamese cultures, how the two of them encounter. We call it inculturation. Mm. Yeah. In meaning in, within the cultures that is between the two cultures. Basically, yeah. that's what I was concerned about in my book. Mm. So in a sense, our understanding of the gospel and the Christian manage, uh, message is shaped by the dynamics going on in that culture. Mm -hmm. And conversely, the culture is challenged by the gospel. Right, is there that right. kind of dynamic going yes. on? Yes. Uh, first of all, when you talk about the gospel, we have mm. to understand that the gospel never arrives, as it were, naked. Yeah. It's already clothed in at least three, four different cultures, layers of cultures. Yeah. Suppose you are an Amer uh, let's say an Italian come to Vienna mm. in the 17th century and preach the gospel. Mm. Now this gospel is not pure. It has been inculturated. It was clothed, expressed in first of all the Hebrew and then the Greek and then the Latin and mm. eventually Italian. And when mm. they come to us, therefore, there is a dynamics, all right? So how we express the gospel in our cultures, one, mm. and how the people to whom we express the gospel receive mm. them. So this is a very interesting dynamics between the two cultures. It's, it's never a passive, you come and just tell and I listen. But mm. my, by listening to you, I really filter the yeah. gospel in my own particular yeah, yeah. ideas, yeah. language, and cultures. Yeah. Mm. Now you say dialogue is the modality of mission, and you talk about a triple dialogue mm. in Asia. Can you yeah. explain to us what that's about? Yes. Uh, basically, uh, the term dialogue is the way in which we talk about the dynamics of the gospel mm. and the cultures. Now, this dynamics is always vested with power. You know, if I am an educated person, I come to a village mm. and the person listen to me and say, oh, this guy come from the United States, he has a lot of money, he has a lot of power. So the, the, it's never a level field. It's always mm. a power struggle. All right. Mm. So when, let's say, a Western missionary come to a poor country, the first thing he or she encounters is a situation of poverty. Mm. And this poverty can be results of, let's say, ecology, results mm. of, of technology, but it's also results of systems. Mm. Globalization, for example, come to mm. our country. In a certain way, it can raise the level, uh, the, the economic level mm. of the country, or it can also affect the poor people. The, we often say the rich get richer and the poor get mm. poor. So the first task of the dialogue is liberation. Mm. 
to allow people to achieve a certain level of mm. life that is humanly dignified, respect human. So that's the first one. So mm. dialogue of, of liberation. Yeah. The second, the triple dialogue, the second form of dialogue is the, the cultures as such. So the first task um, a lot of Protestants do is to translate the Bible into the language of the people. Mm. Now translation is never one to one, right? There's mm. always a dynamic equivalent. So there are certain terms that do not exist in a certain language. Uh, it will be interesting mm. to realize that terms such as sin, salvation, mm. grace, mm. trinity, yeah. Incarnation, those yeah. are terms that are so basic to the Christian message, may not exist in local cultures, mm. right? So there is always a cultural dialogue going on in the translation, and sometimes the culture can teach those who preach the gospel mm. something new. Yeah. Uh, the concepts of God, for instance, or the concepts of salvation. Uh, in the cultural dialogue, both sides, the listener mm. as well as the preacher, can really enrich one another. Mm. And the third dialogue mm. is dialogue with mm. religions. Mm. So cultures can be separate from the religion, the religious context. Mm. As you know very well, in Asia, most mm. religions originate in Asia. Asia is a cradle of religions. So when you come, let's say Christianity come to Vietnam, for mm. instance, it didn't come into a desert, yeah. religious speaking. Yeah. You know, there are already Buddhism in there, there's Confucianism in there, there's a Taoism in there, there's mm. a native uh, religious practices. So the first thing is, they say, how does Christianity fit into Buddhism and vice versa? So mm. you have the triple dialogue of liberation yep. because of the poverty of most people you talk to, the cultures, the mm. language, the way of mm. thinking, the way of living, the, the everyday, and then most difficult is religion. So mm. these are the challenges mm. that I, we uh, most summarize is a triple dialogue that Christianity face, faces mm. when it entered to Asia. Mm. There's a lot of discussion today about the mission of the church mm. and what should the mission of the church be, which is a very big discussion. Right, right. How does mission define the church and church define mission? Right. What kind of relationship yeah, right, is going on right. there? Uh, in one of my um, writings, I talks about a kind mm. of reversal. Yeah. Before you talk mission as a center, right? Mm. And mission is geared towards conversion. So mm. when, let's say mm. in the 17th century, when you come to Vietnam, for instance, you, mm. most mm. people think, well, Vietnam was not yet Christian. My goal as a missionary is mm. to transform Vietnam into a Christian country, mostly by conversion and baptism. So mission mm. was seen in terms of increasing membership through baptism and transform the local, uh, we call it planting the church. A lot of people mm. use the language of planting mm. the church. Mm. I suggest today we reverse that order. And we put, instead of church at the center, we put the reign of God, the kingdom of God. Mm. Because when we ask ourselves, what did Jesus preach? What was he concerned about? He read maybe twice in the gospel, you had the term Ecclesia Church. But the term kingdom of God, Basilea mm. to Teo, yeah. it's all over the place, right? Yeah. So what is, even from the, from the terminological perspective, what is the center of the gospel? Certainly it's not church, but the reign of God. So, the concern of the missionaries, first of all, is to discover the presence of the reign of God already in the midst of the people 
I am not bringing the reign of God. Mm. The reign of God is there already. There is justice, there is peace, there is forgiveness, there is mutual love, there is all kind mm. of things that we consider as the sign, the symbol, or the sacrament of the mm. reign of God. Mm. So the first thing is not like I go into a pagan land, you know, I preach the gospel the first time, but rather I'd like to recognize to discern mm. the presence of the reign of God among the people. And then from there, we build up some sort of common mm. ground and say, okay, you know, in your culture, what do you talk about? Peace, God, forgiveness. In your religion, what are the things that we can mm. really uh, uh, talk to one another? Mm. So that's the meaning of mission today. Yeah, do, you, do you see examples of that in Asia today where, where uh, people are exploring the idea of the reign of God through... Asian ideas and mm -hmm. concepts yeah. and cultural constructs. Where, where mm -hmm. do you see some of that happening in Asia today? Well, yeah. most Asian religions do not, of course, use the concept of reign of God. Yeah. Right? This is very much a Jewish Hebrew concept. Mankut mm. Yahweh, uh, or you call Bazel and Tuteu. But when you ask the question, when the Pharisees and even the disciples of John the Baptist sent, was sent to Jesus and said, are you the Messiah? You know? Jesus didn't say yes or no. He said, okay, the reign of God. Mm -hmm. And go back and tell John the Baptist what? Mm -hmm. The blind see, the lame walk, the, mm -hmm. the lepers are cleansed, mm -hmm. and the dead are right. He said, that's what we see, the reign <laughs> of God, right? So when we go to Asia, we, we don't ask, is there the term reign of God in your religion? <laughs> of course they say no, we don't. Yeah. In many religions, for example, rarely mention God. Buddhism, for instance, it doesn't even mention, you know, discuss God. Mm. But is there the blind see, the sick are healed, mm. the poor are fed? Of course. So that's where we say reign of God. And so when we and Buddhists and other religions, remember, mm. we work together uh, through liberation to the cultures and through the interreligious dialogue, we bring about that reign of God that we are talking. Even though, you know, at the end of the day, only one mm. or two people converted. But that's mm. not a problem. Mm. That's not a problem because our goal is not to bring how many people into the church. Our goal is to recognize and mm. to bring about this, the reign of God, mm. the kingdom of God. Where, where do you see examples of worship and prayer in the life of the Asian church mm -hmm. being done in an Asian way or mm. with an Asian face? Yes, yeah. Well, first of all, uh, there are the level where worship takes place. Mm. Very often we think of mass sacraments, mm, yeah. you know, the way Westerners would think of what the seven sacraments. Yes. Yeah. You, you answer the question, where do Asian people pray? Where does, well, you know, there are some rituals, such as mm. the rituals of veneration of ancestors, which is so central mm. for many Asians, East Asians, like mm. Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, mm. okay? The, the mm. sense of that we are connected with the dead. The dead are not gone, they're in our midst. This mm. is way how a lot of uh, worship in the Asian phase started, right? Mm. The same thing with weddings. You know, most people think of wedding, you know, put a white gown, mm. go to <laughs> yeah. church, a mass, a yeah. dinner and all that. In Asia, wedding, literally, you marry the entire family. Yeah, you yeah. marry the man or the woman, but so the whole ritual of marriage is very different from mm. the way we think. And finally, funerals, the mm. same thing, right? Uh, most of us here in this country, we die in the hospital, they just put us into the uh, funeral home, they just bring us out to the uh, cemetery. Mm. Whereas in Asia, it, it's the whole family. So if you ask me, where do we find this Asian phase? I would say mm. that it is in the cultural, in the rituals of the family. Mm. Now, having said that, I also mm. say that also in the Mass, in mm. the Eucharist, 
Uh, mm -hmm. In the wedding, uh, the sacrament of marriage, the Asian bishops in men have mm -hmm. introduced many local rituals into mm -hmm. the sacraments so that it reflects mm -hmm. really the mm -hmm. worship of the people. And lastly, I, I mm -hmm. would say also in architecture. A lot of churches are built in the style, not, you know, of course the Gothic style or yeah. Romanesque style, but there are some new churches that mm. build in the style of, you know, a pagoda, a temple. So the people say, we, we enter into this place. It reminds us of our own architectures, our music, mm. our song, our dance, you know. You can go to a Philippine the mass of Philippines without yeah. having this mm. exuberance, yeah. dancing and, and singing and so forth. Yeah. Mm. Now the West is becoming progressively multicultural and mm. multi-religious and the church in the West is, is, is trying to keep up with these rapid changes in, in our culture. But the Church of Asia or Asian cultures have, have always been mm -hmm. multi-religious. Yes. Um, what can we learn from the church in Asia in the way in which it engages with pluralistic, mm -hmm. multicultural, mm -hmm. multi-religious environments? Mm -hmm. um, very interesting to ask this question because in the West, up to mm. this point, Christianity is the majority religion. It's part mm. of the culture. We often joke that if you are born in Italian, you're born Catholic. Mm. Once it or not, that's mm. part of your cultures yeah. and so forth. And you're born in England, maybe you're an Anglican, you're not just yeah. England. Today, however, in the West, there are two things happening that you just mentioned. The mm. fact that it is, has become multi-religious. Mm. Migration has brought in a lot of Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims into Italy, mm. Be uh, 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 France, Germany, England. I mean, look at these countries. Mm. The presence mm. of the increasing presence of Muslims is enormous, you mm. know, and it's happened mm. the last few 20, 10, 15, 20 years. Mm. Migration is another element. Mm. So in the West, you know, if you talk about the United States, for instance, uh, there is a book by Diana Eck of uh, Harvard University. Mm. Uh, America has become the most religious, diverse country in the world, mm. and that's just, it's true. So that. On the one hand, you have the presence of other religions. On the other hand, Christianity has lost its dominance of the culture. You know, culturally, it's still a majority. Religiously, mm. how much of it is it's alive? Now, when you look at Asia, Asia is the reverse in mm. a certain sense because Asia, Christianity is minority. If you take an overall statistic, maybe 10% of maybe 4 billion Asians are Christians, right? Mm. In some countries, it's less than 1%. You know, Japan is a typical case. Uh, they mm. talk about breaking the 1% ceiling, you know. Mm. Uh, the most numerous is the Philippines, of course, mm. and then um, uh, Vietnam, Korea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is the more, but when you put the number together, it's very small in comparison with the total mm. population. So we, therefore, you ask the questions, what mm. can the West learn from Asian Christianities? To learn how to live as a religious minority mm. within other religions. Mm. Mm. And that's very interesting. You, mm. When you are minority, you don't assume certain things. Yeah. You don't assume that you are powerful. You don't assume that your voice will be heard. Mm. Uh, you, you don't assume that you have power. So it's, it's a gift to live as a minority in a culture that is majority otherwise that Christian. Uh, the sense of humility that we do not carry, think that our voice will be all heard and followed. Mm. There is a different attitude of respect towards other religions. Uh, even willingness to learn from other religions. We don't think that we can teach them a lot. Mm. That, you know, 
So that, that sort of thing that's not so much um, uh, s specific things to learn, but mm. a way of living mm. as mm. a minority within other religions, other mm. cultures. Now you, you talk about Jesus with an Asian face, which is a, I find it a very intriguing term. Um, what does Jesus look like with an Asian face? Yes. Um, and what are some Asian portraits of Jesus? Right. Um, it's very interesting. When I wrote the first essay years, mm. years ago, that you referred to Jesus mm. Christ with an Asian face, I was not uh, much aware, as I am now, of the presence of Christianity in Asia way back when, you know. Mm. Because mm. you mm. always think that Christianity came with the uh, uh, Portuguese or the Spaniards in the 16th century. <laughs> but then when you look at history, and this is something that I have been saying, look at history, Christianity was in India, very likely by the end of the first century. Uh, by the fourth and the fifth century, the Church of the East, the so-called Nestorian Church, today the greater place mm -hmm. is Iraq, it has gone through Central Asia, and then from there they go into Afghanistan, Pakistan, mm -hmm. India. We know that by the fourth century, there mm -hmm. were churches along the so-called Silk Road, and we are absolutely certain that by the 7th century, these so-called Nestorian Christians went to China, the year 1635, yeah. and it was well received, well widespread. And so you ask the questions, what is this Jesus with the Asian face? It's no mm. longer a hypothetical question, what mm. if? Yeah. Right. What yeah. if Christ has gone? Yeah. But it's the fact. So, for example, in the year 721, they discover what we call a steel, uh, that is S-T-E-L-E, a -E, uh, stone. It was nine feet tall, three feet, three feet wide, in which there is inscribed the story of how the Nestorians came to China in the 7th century. 7th century? Discovered. Yeah, 7th mm. century. Mm. And it's most interesting mm. that in that there is also a summary of the Christian message that was preached to the Chinese mm. in the 7th century, right? Mm. You read that text, not very long, and you see the way they talk about Jesus. They mix Christian terms, Taoist terms, Buddhist terms. So they mm. really, at the time, they were doing what we call today enculturation. Yeah. They were engaging in, engage in translating the Christian message mm. in the language to the Chinese in the 7th century. Mm. So today, a lot of Asian theologians, uh, I would like to mention a book by my dear friend Michael Malados, The mm. Asian Jesus. Mm in which he uh, 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 elaborate the many faces of Jesus. Mm. Just give you a few. He talked mm. about Jesus as a guru. He talked about Jesus as an avatar. A guru mm. is a teacher, right? Mm. Uh, avatar is the descent of the gods. Mm. He talked about Jesus as the teacher. You know, the Confucian mm. model of the teacher, the mm. sage. Mm. And then he talks about Jesus as the dancer, you mm. know, yeah. because within the Indian yeah. tradition there is this sacred dance. Yes. So there is different ways of talking about Jesus besides the more ontological categories mm. of, you know, persons, the natures, divinity, humanity, mm. which we are familiar with since the Council of Chalcedon mm. in the f year 1451. Mm. Now, the two of them are not mutually uh, contradictory. They simply say, the reality of Jesus is so rich that you need to listen to how other people talk about mm. Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Now, you talk about with all the changes that are happening in post-modernity, 
that we need to learn afresh how to be religious irreligiously. Not interreligiously. Interreligiously. Inter oh, <laughs> not irreligiously. No, no, not uh, that could well oh, be. Well, I was going to ask you how that works. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, inter interreligiously. Inter yeah. Um, so, how do we be religious interreligiously? Yeah. But I will come to the questions of irreligious <laughs> as well because that is a challenge yeah. today. You know? yeah. If you look at China, well, we wouldn't talk about that, but first of all, the questions of interreligiously. Mm. Given the fact that Christians in Asia is a minority, minorities, we live amidst other religions. This is not something that we choose to be, it's part of our DNA, as I said. It's mm. part of our DNA. Mm. And so being interreligiously is something not out there, it's in here. Mm. Mm. I am born a Buddhist, I am born a Hindu, or I am born a, 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 a Taoist, whatever. And this is part of me. So the interreligious is really an internal, we call it mm. an intra religious dialogue, mm. you know, mm. Raymond Panica, a very famous uh, priest, mm. he talked about intra-religious dialogue, and then inter-religious, which means that our claims about Jesus as the unique universal savior, our claim about the church as the sacrament of salvation, mm. We make these claims with the full consciousness that other people also make similar claims mm. Mm. about their teaching, about their religious founders, the Buddha, whoever. Mm. Okay? So this interreligious is part and parcel of living our daily uh, faith as Christians in the midst mm. of this continent mm. in which we are a minority. Uh, so that, that's what I mean. This is the challenge. As I said, if you live in a culture where you are a majority, you couldn't care less. If you are 99% are mm. Christians or Catholics, yeah. and the other place, we can tolerate them, right? Yeah. But when you are just a tiny minority with the others, it, it, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. if you want to survive, you have yeah. to, to, to do this sort of <laughs> interreligious dialogue. Now, I made a mistake and said being religious irreligiously, and you thought, oh, maybe that's not a bad idea. No, not at all. I think that's a very good. I think you, you make an intention of Freud and well. Smith, but, 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 but that part is very good. The reason is this. And I tell you the story that, that il illustrates this idea. I came back to Vietnam for a visit in 1995, 20 years after I left Vietnam. And I went to Hanoi, and I went with uh, a tour guide. And he looks to me that very educated man. And so I began talking to him, I said, you know, sir, you know, he was a tour guide, but uh, I said, I said, does it look like this is your full-time job? He said, yeah, it's not my full-time job. I said, what do you do? I said, well, he said he was studying in Russia at the time, in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, in uh, uh, Moscow. He got a PhD and then come back, and now he has no job, so he worked as as the tour guide. Mm -hmm. So I began talking to him about, you know, the Vietnamese culture, the respect for the elders, the mm -hmm. ancestors, and he said, sir, there's no such thing anymore after the communist regime for almost, again, 20 years, 1954 mm. to 1975, right? He said, all's gone. There was an atheist ideology and force on the young. Mm. For, two gen for a generation, 25 years, people didn't hear anything about God, mm. anything about you know, faith, anything so that the whole religious substratum that I assume is still there mm. because I left 25, mm. 20 years ago, yeah. he said, it's gone. It's neither, it, it's not religious, it's not rapidly anti-religious, but it's a religious. 
This is mm. irreligious mm. norm. Mm. Mm. And therefore, the church today, and I, I think this is a, a vital point I'd like to make, um, the greatest challenge for Vietnam, China, Korea, and Japan, the very industrialized country, the greatest challenge is not communism, is consumerism. Mm -hmm. When Vietnam was under communism, the church was full. When the economic embargo was lifted in 1995, and Western goods coming in, and capitalism began to uh, begin to be adopted as a ma free market economy. Now the young people say, I don't need religion anymore. Mm. I have mm. all the television, the mm. iPhones, I think, quite satisfied with them. Mm. The Catholic Church in China, in Vietnam, in Korea were mm. well equipped to deal with communism, and they mm. did very well. Mm. But the Catholic Church is not well equipped to deal with these mm. newer movements mm. of consumerism, of globalism, of mm. market economy. Mm. I think uh, we're going to see the same issue right across Asia, probably. Oh, in yeah. Australia, perhaps yeah. that more than, than well, the West. China might be another example where uh, yes. the church has done really well um, in difficult times. Yes. But yeah. now as the Chinese middle class is rising, yes. more and more people um, are attracted mm. to globalism, consumerism, yes. Yes. and that offers a whole new set of challenges. Let, let me tell you this story. Again, mm. um, about four or five years ago, a professor in Beijing came mm. to visit me at Georgetown University here. He was doing his PhD, he finished his PhD research on St. Augustine. Mm. And he came because I also have written on St. Augustine, and so he came and talked to me. I took him here to lunch, and I asked him, you know, tell me a little bit about Beijing, the university environment. And he was a mm. young PhD, he uh, assistant professor. Mm. And he told me, he said, the greatest challenge for him is to talk to the students about moral values. Mm. The other student come to his class was interested in how can I make money? Yeah. What are the jobs that make money? You talk mm. about his professor of ethics. He said, you talk about ethics, values? The student couldn't care less. So mm. I think that what the, the challenge is not communism. Although I'm, you understand, I do mm. not want to belittle the, 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 the mm. control that the mm. Communist Party control has it in China and Vietnam, you know. But the greatest challenge for the church is not communism. Mm. We, we, we have learned a lot of lessons, we deal with them very well, you know. China since 1949, Vietnam mm. 1954. We learn how to live, modus vivendi, we know how to live with them. But this consumerism, this mm. materialism, with a younger China, mm. it is, you know, I was in Shanghai last April, last year, I said, totally different world. And the challenge of the church is not communism, mm. it's how to reach this mm -hmm. irreligious, not yeah. irreligious thing, yeah. Now, in one of your articles, you use a quite uh, intriguing phrase. You talk about the wisdom of holy fools. Yes, right. Can you unpack for me what is that image mm -hmm. and how does it relate to Christian witness mm -hmm. in post-modernity? Right. The concept of holy fool, the fool that's not really fool but wise, right? Mm. It's a long Christian uh, image in, in, uh, in the Christian tradition. Uh, of course, Jesus himself was regarded as the fool, mm. as the one who was possessed right, by demons. His own family rejected him. Mm. Right? We know that the story. 
And then in the Russian tradition, or oblate, in the tradition of Russian literature, there's always this image of the fool. Mm. Christianity, the monk is some kind of crazy guy, in a certain sense, crazy because mm. he or she is no longer conformed to the norm mm. of the society. He or she is not interested in money, in career, in love, doing something else, in a travel, mm. wandering monk, preaching. You know, in a certain way, he's a fool. And the dividing line between holiness and foolishness <laughs> is very thin, you know. Yeah. How, are you, how much are you crazy or how much are you really an ascetic, you know. Yeah. So. And you have Francis of Sisi, he's also a fool. You know, people think of him as a crazy guy, too. So there is this tradition in Christian spirituality of figure who is foolish for Christ. Like Paul himself in the letter to the Corinthians, mm. I am a fool for Christ. Mm. So that sends out. And I think that today Christianity is challenged to play that role because now we're no longer the majority. We know, uh, even when you are numerically majority, you do not control anymore. Mm. Educational system, hospital, healthcare system, they're all taken over by the states. Education, healthcare, mm. social services. So even if you are 80% Christians, you do not control power. There's no role anymore, a uh, Roman Empire where the, em the, the Pope is higher than the Emperor, right? Mm. Holy Roman Empire. So, in a way, a minority role is always a role of an outsider. Mm. And I talk about the Holy Fool in the sense of it is counter-cultural, a prophetic image that is not easily accepted by the majority. And the, the holy fool somehow subverts the defences of the powerful mm. to speak truth yes. to. Exactly. exactly. Mm. And by the way, the powerful here is not simply the outsider. Yes. It's the insider. Yeah. That even more, yeah. more challenging. That's right. In a certain sense, by Pope insider Francis, you mean the church, for yes, instance. Yeah, yes. The bishops, yeah. the popes, the leaders, and mm. so forth. So the voice of the people, the women, and so mm. forth, I think Pope Francis is, understand this very well. Mm. You know, it's well known that he asked advice of the people when he organized the Synod for the Family last year. Mm. He wanted to hear from people, you know, the voice of the outsider. In mm. this sense, well, all of us are Christians mm. or Catholic, but he wants to hear the voice of an outsider, meaning mm. that the people who are not at the center, at the power, who has the authority to decide what's right, what's wrong. He wants mm. to listen to that voice. So the foolish, the holy uh, uh, fool, or the wise fool, or the foolish wise man, whatever you, you, you use mm. it, has this subversive character that yeah. you just mentioned. How do they use, how does the Holy Fool use wit and satire, mm -hmm. some of these tools yeah. um, to right, speak prophetic right, truth? Right. For example, um, you know, in the Western tradition, mm -hmm. there's always a fool walking at the court yes, yeah. to tell the king yeah. the truth that his courtiers have no courage to say. Yeah, yes. And in a certain sense, he's immune from it. He has immunity, he wears his own cap, and so he yeah. plays the fool, but he tells the king, yeah. not too often, but occasionally, he will tell yeah. the king exactly what the situations are, you yeah. see. So there's a sense of irony. Mm. Irony is central, because mm. you say something and let the people understand the reverse. Mm. Of it. Mm. So, uh, in praise of foolishness, you know, mm. uh, so that y you use metaphor, mm. images that's very rare, very strange, by using this strange metaphor. Well, I mean, a typical of Jesus. 
when he talk about said how I compare the kingdom of God well the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed whoever thought of mustard <laughs> seed right it's very small uh, and grow up to be a big tree that is irony right mm. there you mm. know the discrepancy between the tininess the smallness of it and I know uh, so many you know uh, he even let me tell you about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a woman. It's not what people expect. No, absolutely. No. <laughs> I wouldn't tell. I mean, yeah, if I a mustard talk, seed or a woman. Women, I would say the kingdom of God is like the king. Yeah, maybe people understand, but yeah. like a woman. Mm. You know? Uh, so, in this way, he subverts mm. the usual thinking about power relations. Mm or the praises of God. Mm. And most prophets of ancient Israel play the same role, the holy fool. Mm. You know, uh, the, the most famous is Ezekiel. Mm. You know. mm. Now, what do you feel is most misunderstood about your writings? Uh, well, misunderstood. Uh, I try to write as clearly as I can. Yeah. Uh, I should have written, first of all, in Vietnamese and not in English, so <laughs> nobody can understand. <laughs> I should write in a very obscure style, like, you know, Carl Rahner, you have to read, read it. No, but the most, I think, what I've been misunderstood is that they think that I have denied the necessity of Christian mission. Because I don't talk about mission in terms of gaining, baptizing, bringing a membership, mm. planting the church. I'm talking in terms of recognizing, discerning the presence of the reign of God. And mm. I think, well, you know, Peter Fan says these things, so he no longer uh, require or think that mission of the church is mm. necessary. Absolutely, I think the mission of the church is necessary. Otherwise, no church. Mm. The mm. church is constituted by mission. Church is church only if it does mission, mm. not the other way around, not the other way around. Mm. The church does not own mission. The church cannot dictate how mission is to be. Mm. It's the mission that dictates the church, how the church is mm. to be, so that by reverting, uh, reversing mm. uh, the order between mission and church in a formal way, do you think the church owns mm. the mission? The church sent out missionaries, mm. the church determined how the mission yeah. I do the reverse. Yeah. It is the mission that tells the church what to do, where to do, mm. where to go, how to do it. Maybe planting the church is not the first thing to do. Maybe we shouldn't mm. have the bishop there in the first place, you know, yeah. or uh, the curia there. Mm. So that, that, that's the one thing that I think a lot of people m m might mm. have misunderstood. Uh, my, my. And secondly, uh, the second point that I might have been uh, misunderstood is that somehow I deny that I've been accused of denying that Christ is the unique and universal savior, you know, this mm. uniqueness and universal. Mm. I am not denying, I am saying that these terms, uniqueness, universality, are understood very differently from context to context. Mm. If I go out and I meet with, let's say, a Buddhist and I talk to him, and if I say Jesus is the unique savior, the people think that I am saying that the other people are not good, that the Buddha has nothing mm. to teach me. So I said the word unique, the word savior has served their functions. But in a new context, they may sound very exclusivist, very offensive, very demeaning mm. to other people. And I said that in that case, you'll be very careful using this. Particularly in Asia, where mm. Christianity has been, or was, very unfortunately was, associated with empire. Either the 
Portuguese mm. Empire, or the Spanish Empire, or the British Empire, mm -hmm. the yeah. American Empire. Yeah. Empire is part of, of Christianity in Asia. Mm. And when I come there and I proclaim Jesus as, let's say, the king, image of Christ the king, Christ the emperor, dressed up as an emperor, right? Mm. How do people perceive this image of Christ? Along with, you know, the empire that brought Christianity in. Mm. So in that context, I'll be very careful in using these mm. images, these words, uniqueness and universality, mm. where at one time, colonial powers hold everything. Mm. So that, that mm. I think I will be very careful to, to, to clarify this. Yeah. Mm. Peter Fan, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. Right, Ramil, good to see you. And welcome <laughs> to the United States. I hope you, you have a lot of success with your interviewing uh, other, other yeah. people. Thank you. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.